and I'm going to talk to you about genetic testing for cardiac disorders at GeneDX. Um, and I think Mark's given you a pretty good idea of how we've gotten involved in doing this in the first place. And I am charged with covering several topics. Uh, one is the tests that we offer at GeneDX in cardiology, the methods that we use, uh, the result interpretation, which will take probably most of this time because I think it's the most important thing, and a little bit about our, about our experience so far at uh, GeneDX doing cardiology testing. So we offer a test for HCM, a panel for DCM, one for long QT syndrome, we have a Brugada syndrome panel, we have an ARBC panel, we have a CPVT panel, we have a Noonan syndrome panel, which I'm actually not going to uh, talk about tonight, and uh, close to my heart is a congenital heart disease panel, uh, which I hope will be coming soon. On our HCM panel, we test 17 genes, and I'm sure you'll recognize most of these, um, with, of course, the vast majority of the mutations being in the first, you know, one, two, three, four, five on the left-hand side, pretty much. But we have multiple other genes that have been reported associated with HCM, and that's also in our panel. All of these genes are tested together at the same time. In DCM, we actually have 23 genes, and uh, several of these are mitochondrial genes, so we test for the hot ones like, uh, you know, MYBPC3 and MYH7 and the usual hot stuff, ACTC1, TN and I3, but we also do uh, several mitochondrial genes in, in this panel, and all of these, again, are done at the same time. For long QT syndrome, we currently have 10 genes on the panel, which cover LQTS 1, 2, 3 through 10, and we are in the process of um, adding 11 and 12, which uh, will probably not add a tremendous amount to the panel, but for those very, very rare, rare cases, uh, this would be the panel to give you um, pretty much everything there is right now in LQT. Another thing that is to be kept in mind um, when you're dealing with LQT syndrome is that just doing gene sequencing uh, for the genes LQT 1 through 10 or 11 and 12 is not necessarily going to find the molecular cause of disease in your patient because deletion in LQT, um, in, an, in one of the LQT associated genes may be missed because sequencing is unable to find deletions that encompass a single exon or multiple exons. And I don't want to get into how or why that is, um, but it is. And so we also offer an array CGH-based test to identify um, whole gene or partial gene deletions in, in LQT syndrome. We also have three panels that we've launched fairly recently, a Brugada, an ARVC, and a CPVT panel. CPVT looks kind of sad over there with only two genes in it, but uh, one of those genes is pretty darn big, and it pretty much takes as much space on our sequencer as a full DCM panel does. So how do we look for mutations at GeneDX? Well, we start with DNA that's obtained, hopefully, from a patient blood sample. Um, and that's usually the best type of sample for us to use, although we are developing some non-invasive sample collection methods. For example, we're working on saliva, we're working on urine. We are able to um, accept samples from deceased patients from the medical examiner's office, although the quality of those samples can sometimes be very difficult to work with, but some of them are okay, um, and we're sometimes able to make diagnoses post-mortem. We provide full sequencing of each of the genes on the panel. That means all of the coding exons in the gene and all the boundaries between the introns and the exons of each gene, which we call the splice sites. And what we use is a next generation sequencing platform. And um, I'm not sure if you've heard of next generation sequencing, but it's now generation sequencing. And it's really taken over uh, from the usual type of sequencing that most labs are using these days. And we happen to use an Illumina platform, an Illumina G2. And then, as I mentioned, we do exon level array CGH to look for those rare deletions in patients with LQTS. That test we offer clinically. We also can look for exon level uh, deletions in the genes in the other panels, and we actually provide that more on a research basis. It's there if you are interested in using it, but we're not um, actually promoting it as a clinical test at this time. Uh, we confirm all of the results that we do by going back to that original blood sample that you sent us, and we make a new DNA prep 
from that original sample. And then we use a second method of mutation detection. So we go back to the old gold standard of capillary sequencing, also known as Sanger sequencing, make sure we see the same thing that we saw in the original sample on NextGen. Or we develop a restriction digest analysis, or if we're talking about a deletion, we use a quantitative PCR test. So every sample that comes in and is tested and is, a mutation is identified is confirmed um, using a, another DNA prep from the original sample. This is our internal quality control. So what is this next generation sequencing thing I keep talking about? So this is a very, very high throughput type of sequencing, and it allows you to generate a ton of sequence in a very fast, in quotes, manner, um, which is relatively cost effective, or very cost effective, actually, compared to the gold standard or capillary sequencing on your ABI sequencer that's in the corner of the room. Um, we can sequence many genes at the same time. We can identify most types of mutations doing this, missense changes, nonsense, splicing, little in insertions and deletions. And at some point, we may able be able to uh, find these exon level deletions using NextGen as well. Each run generates two terabytes of data. I don't know if that means anything to you, but when we first started looking at this, to me, that meant we were going to need a room-sized crate to store data for every single patient we tested. In fact, it's not quite that bad but it's a lot of data. Um, and a single instrument, an next generation instrument, has about the same throughput as having an entire warehouse of these large capillary instruments. So this is a huge step forward from the way sequencing has been done um, up until really about a year and a half ago. The main thing is how do you interpret the results that come off your sequencer? 